Today is August 18th. It's the 231st day of the year, and this is the On This Day podcast. On this day in 1963, James Meredith becomes the first African-American to graduate from the University of Mississippi. Meredith enrolls at Ole Miss just a year and a half earlier. Easier said than done. In 1961, the Air Force veteran applies to the university knowing he won't be admitted. Despite the Brown v. Board of Education Supreme Court ruling in 1954 that segregation of public schools is unconstitutional, in 1961, the University of Mississippi still admits only white students. Meredith files a lawsuit that winds its way through the courts. He knows how it'll end, and it's his goal to force the federal government to use the U.S. military to assert his rights as a citizen. And that's what it comes to. 500 U.S. Marshals are loaded into U.S. Army trucks and driven onto campus to accompany Meredith as he enrolls in classes. A riot breaks out on campus at the end of September 1962, and President Kennedy has no choice but to nationalize the Mississippi National Guard and send in U.S. troops to quell the conflict. On the 1st of October 1962, James Meredith enrolls, the first black student to enroll at the University of Mississippi. And this is the beginning of the end for segregation in the state of Mississippi. For the next year and a half, while an Army National Guard division is stationed nearby, Meredith attends classes amidst a constant onslaught of harassment and verbal abuse. He endures it all, completes his education, and on this day in 1963, James Meredith receives his degree in political science, the first black person to graduate from Ole Miss. Meredith's assault on white supremacy, as he calls it, not only brings about change in the segregationist society of Mississippi, it also opens the door for full integration of public schools and later the integration of public accommodations. After graduating on this day, Meredith gets involved in politics and activism, though he doesn't consider himself part of the civil rights movement. Of the movement, he says, quote, Nothing could be more insulting to me than the concept of civil rights. It means perpetual second-class citizenship for me and my kind. James Meredith defies expectations by becoming an active Republican. In 1989, he serves as a domestic policy advisor to former segregationist Senator Jesse Helms, much to the astonishment of some civil rights leaders. Meredith calls the position, quote, the most significant development in my long campaign to make the black race full first-class citizens. But Meredith says Helms is, quote, too liberal for me. And after 18 months, James Meredith is let go from the position for being too far to the right for Helms, particularly due to Meredith's informal association with former Klansman David Duke. James Meredith campaigns for the Republican presidential nomination in the 1992 election, describing himself as relentlessly pro-black and opposed to the, quote, liberal agenda of the elite ruling class, which he believes pigeonholes minorities into the same category, weakening them politically rather than empowering them. Many civil rights leaders consider James Meredith to be eccentric, to put it politely an opinion that Meredith is well aware of. They think I'm crazy, he says, but it don't bother me because I think they're crazy. James Meredith, the Air Force veteran who single-handedly leads the charge against segregation in Mississippi and becomes the first black person to graduate from the University of Mississippi on this day in 1963, later calls integration, quote, the biggest con job ever pulled on anybody. In 1962 and 63, he wages a war against white supremacists, 
He says, quote, But even then, I knew who my true enemy was. It was the liberal elite without a doubt. The white supremacists had a narrower goal. The liberal thing is more permanent, to make the black a second-class citizen forever. And to me, that was sinister. In 2002, a statue of James Meredith is installed on the campus of the University of Mississippi. Born on this day in 1587, Virginia Dare, the first English child born in the New World. Dare is born in the Roanoke Colony in present-day North Carolina. Her mother, Eleanor White, marries Ananias Dare in London, and they join the expedition to the New World led by Eleanor's father, Virginia's grandfather, John White, the governor of the Roanoke Colony. The colonists set out from England in April of 1587, arriving in North America in late July that same year. Virginia is born four weeks after their arrival in the Americas. And that's pretty much all we know about Virginia Dare. A little over a week after Virginia is born on this day in 1587, her grandfather, the governor, returns to England to stock up on supplies for the colony. Even though they've only been in the New World for a month, their voyage across the Atlantic took far longer than they anticipated, and their provisions are running low. Governor John White reluctantly set sail for England to resupply in late August 1587, planning on turning right around and returning to the colony. However, once in England, his return is delayed due to war with Spain. Every British ship is pressed into service to battle the Spanish Armada. It will be three years before John White is able to return to Roanoke. And when he does return to the colony, on this day in 1590, his granddaughter Virginia's third birthday, he finds the settlement completely deserted. Structures have collapsed. There's a stockade fence built around the settlement. And the word Croatoan carved into a post. An indication, perhaps, that the colonists joined up with the Croatoan tribe on present-day Hatteras Island? Or that they were taken captive? Or worse? John White searches high and low for the English settlers, but no trace of the Roanoke colony is ever found, and the fate of the expedition, and little Virginia Dare, is a mystery to this day. We know of Virginia Dare's birth on this day in 1587 because John White returns to England a few days later and shares the news, notes it in his log. Virginia is the first child born in the New World to English parents, but she's not the first European child born in North America. Martin de Arguelles, Jr. is born sometime in the year 1566 in the Spanish colony of St. Augustine in present-day Florida. And many, 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 many years before that, a child is born to Icelandic and Norse explorers in Vinland, what is now present-day Newfoundland, sometime between the years of 1005 and 1013. On some day in that eight-year period, a son is born to Gudrid Thorbjörnardotir and Thorfinn Karlsefnai a son who they name Snorri Thorfinnsson. What a great name. There are 135 days left in the year. On This Day is produced by me, Dave Schultz. Thank you very much for listening. You know I appreciate it. You know I'm going to tell you. Thanks for sharing the show. Thanks for leaving reviews. Thanks for liking it on Facebook and parting it on Twitter. I really do appreciate all of that, too. On this day in 1920, the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is ratified, guaranteeing women's right to vote, prohibiting any U.S. citizen from being denied the right to vote on the basis of sex. So if you're still listening, you have to have confidence in your ability and then be tough enough to follow through. Talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.